Thanks, Dan, and uh, good morning, all. I'm going to talk with you about some examples of uh, fire smarting an existing home landscape, a defensible space. Um, and I'm also going to talk about the role that native plants, I think, can and should play in that. Um, uh, there's been a lot of concern about how to deal with gardens and landscapes in Marin and in the Bay Area in an increasingly long and intense California fire season. Uh, there's especially been a confusion about how to, or frankly, even if, uh, to use native plants in uh, a defensible space. Well, you know, uh, you, you see master gardeners believe that healthy gardens are an important component of healthy and biodiverse ecologies uh, for all of our counties and uh, of a more climate and fire resilient home environment. And we think use a, used appropriately, a native plants might go a long way to help build that healthy, biodiverse, climate resilient and fire in, in smart environment. And that's what's going on here. And we're not having any. Ah, there we go. Okay, so, so here are some key issues we're dealing with. First, we're reducing home wildfire hazard risk. But we want to do that while maintaining home landscapes that build and support a healthy, natural, earth friendly ecological environment. And then, learning how to continually adapt our home landscapes to keep up with the environmental uh, challenges of climate change. Uh, and that's going to be significantly challenged. Uh, this weekend and its heat is a good example of the kinds of challenges we're going to feel field in the future. So uh, now, and, and native plants? Well, in um, 2020, um, uh, uh, Assembly Bill uh, 3074 passed the, um, uh, the California legislature and was signed by the governor. Um, and what that did was establish the uh, regulations for defensible space. How big should it be? What should it be? Where should it be? And so on. Um, and what this public resource code 4291 is how that legislation gets turned into local codes at the county, uh, well, statewide level, and then down to the county and perhaps even uh, to the city or town level. Um, uh, and it's that that we homeowners have to think about. Uh, and that will become effective probably in early 2023. Perhaps even parts of it become effective on January 1st of 2023. So I want to talk a little bit about that because what we've got to see here is that it's beginning to look like um, uh, state organizations responsible for, de for developing fire protection codes may be coming less hard-nosed on the issue of retaining or using native plants and landscapes. In fact, all plants and landscapes. So that's why we're gonna be talking about it. And, and you can see here that the California Board of Forestry and uh, Fire Protection has specifically charged um, uh, a committee to develop um, uh, usage of re, uh, I, I've got something on here that I've got to move. Read it to you. Regionally appropriate vegetation management suggestions that preserve and restore native species that are fire resistant or drought tolerant or both, minimize erosion, minimize water consumption, and permit trees and other uh, vegetation near homes for shade aesthetics, and habitats. So we're going to talk about that as we go through the morning. And thanks for coming. We think this is really important.
So what I'm going to cover uh, is I'm going to focus mainly on specific examples of fire smart implementation and the use of native plants. And I'm going to use what the work that I've done uh, on my home uh, using those guidelines to help reduce wildfire threat risk and to maintain ecosystem health in that fire smart landscape. Um, and uh, I'm living with it. I'm working on it. Uh, it's a continuing exercise and I'm sharing it with you this morning. So, but first um, a word from my sponsor. Um, you know, we master gardeners are, are trained non-paid volunteers. Uh, actually, since this is a holiday weekend, I'm getting triple time uh, on my compensation here. Um, and, and we're part of UC Cooperative Extension. Our mission is to provide unbiased, peer-reviewed, research-based information to homeowners on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable gardening uh, practices. So our website, which is on this slide, is a great resource for lots of information on these topics and more, including fire smart landscaping. And our help desk can get you answers to your questions about those topics. So uh, my first question to you is, is this a good fire smart design? Turning the landscape into a barren wasteland to fire smart a home? Well, a lot of people, you know, actually think this is what is going to happen. But we will tell you that anything like this in any or all part of the landscape is not healthy or a fire safe solution to reducing fire hazard risk. In fact, it could exacerbate the situation. Um, and I don't really know of any um, uh, agency that would espouse this. So our guiding premise is that it's also unnecessary. Homeowners can have a healthy, beautiful, biodiverse and sustainable fire smart landscape like this without denuding their gardens. That's the main thesis of this presentation. Home landscapes and gardens are important elements of a healthy environment and ecology in Marin County or anywhere else in the Bay Area, or frankly, in the state. They're worth preserving because they rebuild diversity by protecting and extending uh, our unique plant communities, by encouraging beneficial wildlife, by creating habitats for other native plants and insects, birds, mammals, and frankly, other loving creatures, including uh, us by preserving and protecting natural environments, uh, by avoiding materials and practices that may harm them, by building and protecting the life in their soil, and by reducing the use of water, energy, and other critical resources. And even by working to mitigate climate change, encouraging vital natural services we can't do without, a clean air, sequestering carbon, building soil, minimizing or eliminating waste, purifying groundwater and more. That, you know, creating and, and improving all of these in home landscapes is one role of native plants uh, in a healthy fire smart garden. The design of the landscape and its defensible space using fire smart guidelines reduces wildfire hazard risk, but the use of native plants enhances that natural environment. It makes it healthier, more sustainable, and frankly, probably more fire resilient. So, you know, a healthy and fire safe residential landscape is the result of providing best horticultural and gardening practices for your yard. Choosing plants that are in sync with your local environment, placing them in the garden with adequate vertical and horizontal space, giving them the right maintenance and care to keep them healthy and fire safe. Why is all that? 
because healthy plants, frankly, are more likely to be more fire resistant than plants struggling to survive. And always on this slide, it does that. So let's start by briefly thinking about why and how to use California natives in a defensible space. Using native plants is one important way to get sustainable, earth-friendly gardens. They make them better. They're more in tune with local plant environments. They support biodiversity um, and they lighten the ecological load on the environment. They, that produces a healthier home and community landscape that can also be more fire resilient. And why is that? Well, that's because native plants have grown up with everything else in the, in the land around us. They've evolved together with our uh, Mediterranean climate, our geography, our topography, our soil and the animals, birds and insects that inhabit it. They're, they're an integral part of California's true landscape. Native plants have been deeply associated with parts of long established local native ecosystems for tens of thousands of years. Natives may just fit in and perform better than non-natives in these areas. They are better associated with an ecosystem's microclimate, soils and mycorrhizal subterranean networks. This close association may also be the reason that native plants normally stay hydrated longer on just average amounts of rain or uh, irrigation water. So that's another way that they can be not only healthier, but also more resilient to wildfire. Moreover, studies show that native wildlife visit and use native plants more frequently than non-native plants and stay longer when they do that. With some pollinator, butterfly, and bird species, this can be as much as three to five times more frequently and or longer. That's why building native plants in your garden is one important way to build habitat that may help decrease the serious decline in populations of these wildlife. My little Rufus hummingbird visitor knows this. He headed right for the hummingbird sage uh, in my garden the morning he arrived. So finally, the deep root systems and canopies of native plants may also stabilize and preserve soils on slopes reducing erosion. That's important because in the hilly, uh, terrain all around us. Erosion can often be a landscape and soil quality problem, but the native root systems may hold a hill better and more sustainably than anything else. So this hill in the picture is about 30, more than 30 feet uh, from my home here in North Nevada and was planted using native plants with vigorous root systems like Ceanothus, Manzanita, California Fermantia, California buckwheat, dwarf coyote bush, and sage to reduce erosion on steep slopes like this. And so far it works. But I want you to note how the plants or plant groupings in this uh, landscape are spaced for fuel separation. That's important too. A hill is not just functional. It's also beautiful when it's in bloom from early spring through fall. And it's a great habitat for beneficial insects, pollinators, birds, and small wildlife. So having talked about using native plants, let's look at some specific example of how we might build defensible space to reduce wildfire hazard risk without destroying landscapes. I'll also show some examples of using native plants to build or maintain sustainable earth-friendly gardens. But we want to start with one overarching principle in establishing defensible space. In reducing landscape fire risk, 
how we do our gardens and landscapes is more important than the plants we choose. Defensible space and the right plants in the right places, given the right care. So let me quote Steve Swain, uh, our, uh, in Marin County, uh, UCC environmental horticulture advisor about this. That what he says is that when we cre creating a fire smart landscape, you know, we invoy, advise homeowners to design defensible space and maintain their landscape according to UC guidelines. There are no published fire wise or fire resistant plant lists that are science based or peer reviewed. Design and maintenance are more important than plant selection. And so the real answer is that you should choose a landscape design and plants, native or non-native, whose requirements, cultural, mature size, maintenance, and water requirements are in sync with your side, with your uh, uh, environment. As I've said, that'll repro reproduce of both a healthy landscape and one that is more resilient to um, wild, wild fire. Uh, and here's the mantra I'm going to follow as best I can in the work I'm going to describe. A first, plan and create defensible space around and between structures. And that includes the potentially flammable objects that you might not think about like trash, can, trash cans or bins, wood piles, tree and other garden debris, mulch, and yes, including your plants and your neighbors too. Second, deal with plants as potential fuel in the landscape. Think about their placement, spacing, and separation to reduce fire spread. Group them um, and build fire breaks between those groups. Limb up trees and prune shrubs to reduce fire ladders. Um, and the continuing pruning, maintenance, and irrigation needed to keep a healthy garden healthy and fire safe. That's, that's how we do landscape. Start by developing an overall, sorry did not change. Oh, yes, it has. Start by developing an overall fire smart plan, working from the house out, placing and spacing appropriate plants and materials, given their relationship to the home and other and to other plantings. Fire separation and reduction, fuel separation and reduction are the primary aims and planning consistent maintenance and appropriate irrigation um, are critical to maintaining those goals. Then work that plan, prioritizing your work and projects, working from the house out, and it all doesn't have to be done at once. Um, if you can only get one thing done, if you haven't even started, work on the area from zero to five feet from the house or other buildings on your site. And let's talk about that. That's the most important area, zone zero or zero to five feet from the home. That's called the amber resistance zone. And this is what we need to do to protect against ember fall in that area immediately around the home. And ember fall is responsible for most damage or destruction of homes and other structures in a wildfire situation. So here are some examples of what a homeowner might want to look for and do. No flammable mulch, fencing, furniture, and so on in this area. No dead branches or other plant debris in this area or on the roof uh, on top of it. No tall plants under the eaves. Why? Because the flames that might uh, ignite in this area will rise two to three times the height 
of the plant that is burning. Nothing flammable attached to or close to the house and no branches um, within 10 feet of the roof or from the chimney. Um, that's what we really need to do to protect against ember fall. Um, and here are some examples of what you, what you might look for and what you might do. So if there are foundation plants like these, uh, that are touching or close to the house, like all of them, uh, and or in front of windows or under eaves, like these, um, and or that are more than 18 or 20, uh, four inches tall, like these, uh, or that are twiggy or easier to ignite by embers, like these, they should be removed and replaced with materials safe to use within five feet of the home, including non-combustible rock, gravel, concrete and pavers, decomposed granite and materials like that. Plants, if plants are used, they should be, as shown in the slide, not touched any part of the house. And they should be only low growing, non woody, appropriately irrigated perennials or annuals or succulents. Um, and we'd like you to consider even here native plants. So let's take a look at some of this. Um, in the front of my home, unfortunately, the spaces available. Uh, were too narrow to prevent uh, plants from touching the house, uh, and also irrigation was difficult to uh, bring in. So pebbles alone replaced problematic plants. Uh, actually, uh, the plants are a good. Uh, the pebbles are a good uh, color match to the house, uh, and they actually look pretty good. Um, certainly better than the blacktop. Uh, uh, driveway in front of them. There was a similar situation on the side of the house. Uh, roses and other uh, small leaved uh, plants in this area uh, were right up against the house and under windows uh, and eaves. And uh, they were replaced, removed and replaced uh, by pebbles. And between the pebbles and the decomposed granite uh, walk here, that gave me a good ground clearance of eight to 10 feet uh, between my house and the plantings that remained next to them. So now to think about plants to replace any that might need to be removed. So uh, we'd like you to consider native plants for this or any other area in the defensible space. Uh, and the reason why is this. Here's a good list of plants for plants, any plants, in a fire smart or earth friendly landscape. Uh, first of all, they should be healthy or easy to keep healthy. They should be water wise, pollinator friendly, ha and habitat builder. They should be well behaved, and by that we mean non invasive and producing little debris around them. Uh, and they should be uh, relatively low care and maintainable if possible. Uh, that's a pretty good list um, for any plants. Uh, and as native plants check most, if not all of those boxes above, native plants might be among some of the best choices you could make. Um, so in this area, in the back of our house, we had an area where tall, tall rosemary and lavender plants were planted right against the house. Um, uh, and they were removed. Uh, and as shown in the area here, they were replaced by mostly uh, native plants and herbs, uh, things like um, uh, non-combustible pebbles 
to keep the plants from touching the house uh, and providing a fire break. Uh, those are about two to three feet wide. And the borders beyond those are low growing coral bell hybrids, low growing sage hybrids, catmint, herbs, and uh, beach strawberry plants. And as you can see in this area, it really looks beautiful in spring and early summer. Uh, and when it's finished, uh, blue flowering, it's cut back to a fire smart two to four inches, as shown in this picture. Um, now, the, the thing that I'm going to show you are things that we've done here. Um, you might have different areas, but what I, the real message I'm trying to say is that this can be done. It can be done without bankrupting you or destroying your garden, and you can do it. If I can, so can you. So a lot of homeowners are particularly concerned that leaving zone zero barren after re removing problematic plants might ruin the beauty and the, 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 the value of their homes. But I think as you've seen from the previous slide, um, you can deal with that by, by appropriate plants for the right places and given the right care. There are use, useful and lovely uh, solutions uh, to that concern. Remember, no plant should touch the house or be too close to it. There should be a non-combustible space between the plants themselves and between the plants and the home. So in addition to low-growing coral bell and sage shown in the previous example, there's other lots, there's other lots of uh, choices of native plants. Uh, how about some native wildflowers to start with, like uh, Clarkia Farewell to Spring, or Cream Cups, or California Bells, or Five Spot that this California ringlet um, butterfly is enjoying, and you can too. Um, and then we have perennials, low-growing herbaceous perennials that might work well also in this area close to the house. Uh, things like um, blue-eyed grass, beach strawberry, uh, penstemon, low-growing penstemon, and low-growing uh, California buckwheat. And we also have succulents, native California succulents that might work in these areas. Uh, things like, um, this is Catalina Dudleya, uh, this is Coast Dudleya, this is um, uh, Bitterroot Lewisia, beautiful flowers, and Cliff Maids or Siskiyou Lewisia. So there's, there's lots of choices that are available to you. And, and, and even in this significant area, and I will tell you that um, the committee that is working on the statewide um, uh, code uh, on this area uh, is in fact considering some use of well chosen, well maintained plants in this area. So now to consider the area beyond zone zero, zones ones and one and two, uh, beyond five uh, feet from the house. So uh, at this distance, flames or other uh, issues are likely uh, less likely to ignite a, ignite a home. So the looking at examples of these, that's taken into, into consideration. Closer to the house, lower and appropriately irrigated plants. Further away, you can use larger trees and shrubs. Um, 30 feet from the house, um, you can use a wood mulch. Uh, vertical and horizontal space between shrubs and trees, especially on slopes, is important. Hardscape fuel breaks between plantings uh, in the garden uh, where possible is a good way to deal with this. Um, and all plants 
should be accessible for cleanup, maintenance, and irrigation because maintenance is key there. And because the distances here may go up to or beyond a site where the homeowner may have to work. So the homeowner may have to work with neighbors to achieve appropriate defensible space between the two properties. Uh, Bob? Yes? Question for you. Um, a fuel break between plantings where possible, how wide should the fuel break be? Um, it, it, it should probably be somewhere on the order of two to five uh, feet, if you can do that. Uh, my problem is, um, since a, on a steep slope, it, if you're gonna use things like pebbles and so on, um, they eventually begin to slide down the slope. And so it becomes a, a maintenance issue to keep moving them back up. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk to that uh, point a little bit later. But All right. yeah, um, um, I had my uh, uh, area in inspected uh, by the Novato Fire District inspector. Um, and uh, he said that uh, the staircases and paths that I had through my garden that are about uh, uh, four feet apart was sufficient fire break. So mm -hmm. that's what I offer for that. He knows more about it than I do, I'll tell you that. We also had uh, a, a question from Jillian on your uh, pretty picture of your hillside. Uh, she wonders how you irrigate that hillside. It's mostly irrigated by uh, drip. Um, and then I have uh, around it um, some large uh, impulse uh, irrigators that throw about a 40 foot slot to uh, which I use during the summer to water the entire garden. I usually turn them on once or twice a month for about one to two hours, particularly in this drought, the garden really needs that. Mm -hmm. including, frankly, the oak trees. Um, so, uh, but, but it's mainly um, irrigation, uh, 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 drip irrigation, um, and the, the garden is about 65% native plants. Um, and I would say that most of those have been in the ground at least four to five years. So they are fully established and what they want is less frequent, but deeper watering to get down to the roots. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is an example of what you should start the year with. That's mowing the annual grass and weeds that grow up on property anywhere. Um, if, if you look at the, uh, this picture, uh, this, this is what it looked like this February. Uh, it was about three to four feet uh, in grass and weeds, which we had mowed. Uh, and it looked like this after we had it mowed down to about uh, four inches. Um, and we did that in February this year because of the rains that we had in October and December. Uh, things went berserk. Um, uh, normally, what we would do is um, we would uh, mow in April and again in late May to mid-June. We do that every year without fail uh, because that's probably one of the most dangerous things that we could have on or around our property. So here's another example of a real problem that we could have here. Um, problematic plants. Um, this is my driveway and uh, this is an acacia hedge that's about 40 feet long. Uh, and in this area, it's about uh, six to seven feet tall. Beyond it um, is cotoneaster, a um, really dense planting of invasive cotoneaster growing under uh, low growing uh, coastal live oaks. And this is on a steep hill that's right below my home. So it produced a potentially serious fire ladder that really needed some work. So in the after picture, we got rid of the acacia 
and the Katoni Aster. We limbed the coast wide oaks up uh, until they were 10 to 12 feet above uh, the, the uh, uh, grade. And that removed the fire ladder and allowed a clear entry for uh, firefighting equipment if it ever came to that. Uh, but in fact, it really looks a little barren. Well, we have a surprise here. In the spring of 2019, a few small arroyo, lupin, and California copy, uh, poppy plants volunteered in that space. Those plants must have been in the ground asleep for 10 or more years since the house was built. Um, they went to seed, we added some seed, and in the spring of 2020, that's what we got. 40 feet of uh, native arroyo lupin, California poppies, and even some clarkia. They started blooming in early to mid-February. They continued, uh, frankly, almost to May. And then since they're annuals, we cut them down for seed for the following year. And they came up in the following year. So it's truly fire smart, and it's a really great use of native plants. Um, I, I, there's nobody ever comes in our driveway that doesn't comment about those in the springtime. So even after removing the, all that stuff, my neighbor's large myoporum uh, hedge uh, was still overgrown into my yard. Uh, and it was close to my house. More important, it was infested with myoporum thrips. So there was significant dead or dying wood, as you can see in this picture. Um, so I had it trimmed on the property line from my side of the fence. It looks better now. It's clear to more than 10 feet from the side of my house. But frankly, sooner or later, these are going to have to be removed uh, because they endanger my neighbor's home as much as they endanger my home. So this is in zone one and two. Um, we have 10 beautiful uh, deciduous valley oaks uh, on our property. This is uh, a, one stand of them. Um, and the oak branches were growing almost to the ground. Actually here, they were actually touching the ground in the middle of the garden. Uh, and, and that's a potential fire ladder hazard. So uh, here, it looks as if trees and plants were removed. But really, all that we did was to limb the trees up to about 10 to 15 feet. And that work was done uh, in one afternoon uh, by a certified arborist. And here's another uh, under oak tree planting uh, further out in zone two. Uh, we had some prostrate leptospermum planted to provide erosion control on a, on a really steep area below our uh, vegetable garden. And so it also provided some wild uh, white flowers in spring under the uh, tree shade. This is a bad choice. Wrong plant, wrong place. These had become overgrown and twiggy. They were in an area that was difficult to maintain, especially to prune out dead wood. And with their needle-like foliage, it all added up to a serious potential fire hazard. So we got rid of them. Uh, they're gone now. Uh, we put wattles on the hill um, uh, to hold the hill until we could replant. And now uh, I just bought the plants for this. We're replanting it with uh, Anchor Bay Ceanothus and some low growing uh, Catalina perfume this fall. Here we have uh, two really good pollinators. The Budlia here uh, was a good attractor to pollinators, and so was the Salvia banda GEI uh, on the right here. Uh, they're very useful pollinator plants, but they had both become seriously overgrown and twiggy. And since they're under at Valley Oaks, they could have also become a significant uh, fire ladder hazard. They've now been reduced in height and width, as you can see in this picture, and they have better vertical and horizontal separation. 
and the dead wood has been removed. And we're going to keep them that way. Um, and continuing work and maintenance on other areas uh, of the hill has created a less dense planting of established native plants. They have better horizontal separation to reduce um, or slow potential fire spread. Um, my colleague in this, uh, it's even better. He's not only got good plant separation, even better, he uses non-combustible stone and rock on the areas between uh, the plants and paths and patio areas um, to keep good fire separation and provide small fire breaks that minimize or eliminate wildfire runs and, and, emperor, and ember flare-ups uh, in the garden. Um, and so this is what um, you know, I meant by using um, fire breaks. Um, and um, he knows, frankly, a lot more about um, the specifics of this than I do. And so you can see from his, the distances that he's used, that these are appropriate distances to get reasonable fire breaks in the garden. So we, we've got reasonably good hardscape um, uh, between the garden and my home. Uh, and uh, we've got um, uh, on patios, um, uh, staircases, and paths around the garden that provide good fire breaks. But frankly, um, in, in, in the garden itself, our use of uh, hardscape uh, could be a whole lot better. Um, and uh, we're trying to figure out a way to do that. I mean, you know, probably this hill should have been terraced, uh, but when uh, my uh, landscape architect that I work with gave me the price for that, um, uh, after she picked me up from the floor, um, I decided we try to use plants instead. <laughs> it's a hell of a lot cheaper. So well, we're really trying to achieve horizontal and vertical space to increase fuel separation and reduce fuel mass. And we, we've got a pretty good start on that and we're keeping it well done. Um, and it, it, it shows you this and the foregoing examples show that Wildfire hardening of the landscape can be done without leaving large barren spaces or denuding the garden. Often you can achieve this uh, desired result by, by pruning um, the bulk and height of the plants or by removing branches like limbing up uh, or you know, the, replacing the odd plant with a, a, a appropriately spaced um, and uh, maintain uh, native plants. Uh, so it works for us, it can work for you. Um, well, while this uh, picture's up, um, could you just uh, point out a few of the native plants for people so they can associate what they look like? Uh, sure. Um, this here is uh, a, um, a, a almost a low hedge of dwarf um, uh, uh, coyote bush. It's, uh, it, it's actually Twin Peaks. Uh, there's two dwarf ones, Twin Peaks and Pigeon Point. Um, and this, is, this was put in because in this area of the hill, um, it's about 100% grade or 45% uh, 45 degree angle. And we were that this is this is instead of terracing it, this holds the hill, uh, and uh, and um, coyote bush is particularly good at that because it's got deep roots that go way 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 down. Um, here we have behind it. These are um, uh, Carmel Ceanothus, 
um, a Yankee point and, and, and the species itself. Um, uh, in, the, in this area here, um, we've got, um, this is a point cell spreader and um, uh, bees bliss uh, sage, uh, and they are good ground covers, uh, also deep rooted. Uh, and over here, this is, uh, in this area, is um, uh, Pozo Blue Sage, uh, a uh, hybrid between Leucophilia and Clevelandii. And then over here, we've got, um, uh, these are, uh, what do we got? Oh man, I can't remember. That's, uh, well, some of it is Calve uh, Sage, Clovendii, um, but it's also uh, buckwheat, mostly I would say coast buckwheat uh, and uh, the red buckwheat uh, area. Uh, these two here are Ceanothus uh, blue jeans. Um, you saw them in in um, uh, in, uh, in uh, bloom. Uh, they call them blue jeans because they look like thousand washed blue jeans. Uh, so that's what they do. And then uh, around this area, uh, we've got a lot of Pacific mist uh, Arctostaphylos or Benzanita uh, planted. And it's, that's also where we have the uh, Ken Taylor uh, Fermenti uh, planted as well. And there are more. Um, uh, uh, Ceanothus. Uh, I'm, I'm a Ceanothus nut. Um, my wife says, uh, I've never met a Ceanothus that I didn't like, and she's right. Uh, I grow now 21 species or cultivars of Ceanothus. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an obsession and maybe even an addiction, but it's harmless. So anyway, that's Bob, a, a question from the audience is, is, is there a wood mulch up on the hillside at all in your garden? Yeah, it starts at about here behind uh, this area. And that is a good 30 to 40 feet uh, from my house. Mm -hmm. And it goes up to uh, the path here that runs right along there. Uh, it does not go into the olive grove, which was here when we bought it. It makes good olive oil, actually. Um, uh, so, so it's limited to the area well above uh, the 30 foot line. Um, and, and it's been that way since we did this. Uh, most of the wood mulch actually um, is, um, you know, from uh, tree companies uh, that dropped us 10 cubic feet of it. Uh, and it's been on there for seven years. So it's in pretty good shape for that. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at some examples of good fire smart design, or at least I think it's good fire smart design here. What we have is on, on, on the hill, we have um, trees and shrubs spaced on the slope to prevent erosion. The non-combustible retaining wall here runs along the entire area through here uh, and around the home. It, it, it creates a fire break between the, the hill uh, and between the planting island and the rest of the landscape, we have the uh, patio and the paths uh, on the level part uh, and a small lawn over here, which we're getting rid of um, um, and to prevent uh, fire or to provide a fire break. Um, now, this, this area is a, a small area. Uh, and it is small, uh, and, uh, it's about 15 feet 
uh, across by about 18 feet deep. Uh, and it was planted uh, as a um, pollinator friendly uh, ha habitat corridor garden. You'll, he you'll hear more about uh, habitat corridor gardens when Doug Ptolemy uh, talks to you. Um, and he's the, uh, he's, he's the, uh, you know, um, the, the muse for this garden. Uh, I, 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 I try in other talks to get uh, Marinites to use these to connect our fragmented uh, open spaces together. Um, but these are mainly native or Mediterranean climate plants. They, they attract a ton of pollinators, bees, butterflies, um, uh, hoverflies. Uh, on a good late spring, early summer day, you don't have to you don't have to look at this. You can hear the garden, um, and it's amazing. So, so that's an example. Here are some of the plants that are in there. Uh, this is uh, lilac verbena, sometimes called the Cedro Islands verbena. Uh, here's the um, uh, our friend, the Rufus hummingbird and the hummingbird sage. Here's some of the uh, red buckwheat, red California buckwheat in bloom. Here's some of the, uh, this is um, bees bliss sage, which when it's in bloom is really a stunner. Uh, and this is pozo blue in bloom. Um, and uh, it blooms oh, usually from late spring almost to midsummer. Um, here we've got some uh, uh, emerald carpet, manzanita. Uh, this is Everett's Choice, uh, California fuchsia. Uh, this is a Baja pitcher sage. Uh, here is point cell spreader, uh, a higher, uh, larger uh, uh, sage uh, ground cover. And here is a beautiful, uh, would you believe, California native clematis, um, which when it's in bloom in the spring, late spring to early summer, it's the first thing that hits your eye when you come into the garden uh, because you don't expect to see it in the garden. So in terms of uh, larger shrubs or small trees, uh, here we've got um, Western redbud in bloom. Uh, these are mostly on the uh, uh, on the border between zone ones and two in my garden. Uh, this is a large uh, manzanita. It's manzanita monica. Uh, it'll eventually in this picture. It's about oh I'd say seven feet tall. It'll get about double that height. And about ten feet in diameter. So this is that's about uh, sixty feet from from the house in a in an area where I've got other large shrubs. Uh, one of the things that really striking is this uh, Ray Hartman uh, Ceanothus in bloom. Uh, this is was in this is a picture taken this spring. When this baby is in bloom uh, and the sun hits it. You know, you just want to sit there and look at it. Uh, it's just amazing. And it'll get another, oh, five to seven feet tall uh, and about that in diameter. So I can't wait till it gets that big. So other large Ceanothus like Dark Star can work in this kind of area. Um, and here we got some things that can get really big. Uh, some of these don't grow in my garden because they're frankly too big for it. This does grow in my garden. This is a spring showers California current. Uh, it can get about 15 feet tall. Uh, same with this sugar bush. This does not grow in my garden. Uh, I wish I had one actually. Uh, and here's summer holly. In this Las Palitas picture, this thing is 25 feet tall. 
So you've got to have a real big garden for it. Uh, this does grow in my garden. This is not my uh, plant, but it's about a 20 foot tall wax myrtle, Pacific wax myrtle, America Californica. Uh, it's partic these, these plants are particularly good for um, you know, a privacy hedge. Um, and they're relatively, um, I, will, I will say, fire resistant. Um, and uh, not only that, but they produce uh, berries that the birds uh, just love on their way uh, north uh, in the fall. Okay, so, and further from the home, this is uh, my uh, Yankee Point um, uh, Caramel Cianothus uh, in bloom. Uh, here we have the uh, uh, Santa Rosa Island Sage, the uh, Salvia bed, the GI uh, in bloom. And this is what uh, Catalina perfume uh, looks like. Uh, it's an evergreen ribes. Uh, and it gets about two to three times the size in this picture. And it's right now in this picture, about six feet wide by about three feet, uh, six feet in this dimension by about three feet in this dimension. It's, it's uh, bloom is, you know, very small, but it has beautiful, um, it's got a beautiful perfume to it. It's aptly named. Um, and the berries that it produces are also enjoyed by the birds. And then finally, we've got here some really large, uh, uh, Lewis Edmonds Manzanita. Uh, I've got a hedge or a grouping of about eight of those. Uh, these are Toyon. Um, they bloom. They have beautiful red berries. I've always wanted to use the red berries to be Christmas berry, uh, which is what one of the common names, uh, decorations, uh, but the birds get to them uh, before I ever have a chance to do so. Here's my Ken Taylor. Uh, right now, it's about six feet tall here and about, I would say, 15 feet uh, in this direction. It's in full bloom in this picture. And it's once again, it's, it's an eye candy that your eye can't miss when it comes into the garden. And here are the two um, uh, Ceanothus blue jeans. So that's that's a, that's an example of some of the plants that we're growing here. Um, uh, we have a very hot, dry uh, uh, microclimate uh, today because we're expecting um, 90 plus, maybe even to 100 degree temperature. The temperature on this hill will be 120 degrees. Uh, and so I will have those sprinklers on tonight. Okay, so so that's that's up to now. We've been talking about uh, you know defensible landscape around the home to reduce wildfire hazards. But what but what about the home? Well, you know, as master uh, master gardeners, we're not trained to give homeowners advice on home home hardening unless one of us happens to be a builder or a firefighter or something like that. So when we get a client who needs this kind of advice, the first place we say him, send him or her is here. So Fire Safe Marin, harden your home. It's really an amazing place to get information and support on hardening your home. Uh, but to give you some ideas of what might be done, let's consider the work that we had completed on my home. I can talk about that as an expert since I lived it and paid for it. So this is my house. Um, it's got a class A concrete shingle roof. Uh, it's got metal uh, gutters and downspouts. Um, it's got twin pane, but not thermal pane windows all around. And it's got an internal sprinkler system. But it's all in this picture, wooden shingles uh, and trim and foundation 
soffit and gable vents that are not fire resistant. Um, so we needed to do something about that. So the first thing we did when we were hardening the landscape was we installed uh, some Vulcan fire resistant um, foundation vents all around the house. Um, and uh, these, these are ones that when they get hot um, from embers or whatever, they actually swell um, a compound in there and shut right down. That keeps the embers from getting into the crawl space. It also means that after the fire, assuming the house is still here, um, you have to replace those because they've, they've done their job, if you will. So, um, but you know, uh, wildfire may not be the only threat to your home. Uh, here are some neighbors we have uh, that can do some uh, serious damage as well, including, surprisingly, making your home more vulnerable to ember storm incursion. And, and you might ask, how do they do that? Well, that's how. Um, our feathered friends here drilled hundreds of holes on two sides of the house, and they uh, filled them uh, with acorns. You can see when we removed this siding, what we found underneath there. It's about two bushels of uh, acorns in there. Um, and the problem is, I didn't think about this, but when we had our, our home inspected by the fire district, uh, our inspector pointed out that those holes could allow embers to get into the interior space between the interior walls and the wood siding, possibly taking the house. Um, if you haven't had an inspection by your local fire agency, call them, have an inspection. Um, it is well worth your time and it is well worth the information that they will give you. Um, the inspectors are trained uh, and for the most part are, you know, um, uh, are interested in helping you save your house, but not stripping everything in your property away. So we wanted to make our home fire and acorn woodpecker resistant. The first thing you have to do is when you do these kinds of jobs is bring it up to code. And here you can see that we've installed plywood sheathing in much of the house uh, because there was none. Apparently when this house was built uh, in Marin County, there was no code about plywood sheathing. There is now, so it had to come up to code before we could get um, a uh, permit. Uh, and then we installed hardy board fiber cement fire resistant siding, trim and soffit enclosures. Uh, and we did uh, falcon fire resistant soffit and gable builds. So that's what the house looks like now. Um, uh, we, we had to replace this window here. So that's why this piece of it hasn't been done. Um, uh, so, you know, thank the good Lord, we haven't had a fire since this uh, was done. Um, so I can't report on that. Uh, but after almost six months, I can report that there's not been one bloody acorn woodpecker hole drilled in this site. Um, and that's, you know, we're 50% of the way, frankly. So to recap, uh, native plant fire smart landscapes are important. They nurture soil, they encourage biodiversity, they mitigate climate change, they encourage wildlife, and I believe uh, they help reduce wildfire risk. Native plants pro prevent erosion. And when they're well spaced on slopes, they are suitable for planting just about anywhere. Creating that space, reducing wildfire risk means good placement, good pruning, removing problematic plants, replacing them, and maintaining them. 
And so what do you look for in native plants? Well, zero to five feet from the house, low growing, ignition resistant, herbaceous annuals and perennials, succulents, nothing, nothing touching the house. In zone one to five to 30 feet from the house, smaller shrubs and trees, good vertical and horizontal separation, non-combustible fire breaks between plant clusters where you can actually use them. And then finally, in uh, 30 or more feet from the house, larger shrubs, trees and shrubs and wood mulch. So we've got um, uh, a uh, handout uh, on the website, on the uh, slope website for you that's got a, a significant amount of this information. I wanna call example to one thing on that handout is and this, this whole thing is on is in your handout. It's one of the pieces. But a lot of the uh, information that I presented this morning and even more is summarized in this uh, printable Fire Smart Landscape handout on our website. If you use this URL, go to the website, you can then print uh, this. Um, and I, I have tried to uh, see if I could get it to go uh, on this, but it will not, it's not a live uh, URL in my presentation. It is uh, in your handout. Um, so questions? Well, wow. Thank you, Bob. It was a ton of great information. Um, there are some questions. Um, one that interests me in particular is uh, where is the place for a traditional vegetable garden in, in the fire safe scenario? Um, it's anywhere, anywhere, you, anywhere you've got the space or soil. My vegetable garden, if you, uh, that horrible leptospermum example that I have, the, the, if, if you saw something that looked like a fence behind it and above it, that's my vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's all raised beds because the soil in uh, Novato is pathetically bad in this area. Uh, I went out to do what master gardeners do, take a soil sample right before I planted the garden. I went out with a railroad pick. <laughs> not, I could only get down six inches. Well, veg vegetable gardens are largely herbaceous plants that are watered regularly and probably are not particularly fire hazardous, I would assume. That's true, um, they're, but, but, uh, but they're probably too tall for the zero to five area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one of our listeners asked that you repeat uh, at, at the very beginning of the talk, you uh, mentioned some, uh, I think some source, native plant source or description uh, websites. Um, is that handy for you to repeat again? Well, um, uh, the... Uh, uh, some of it's in the handout that you have. A, 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 a really good one, is, well, there, there are two that are really good. Uh, one is our own website, uh, um, uh, Marin Master Gardener website. If you go to it and click on uh, plant lists, there are two or three um, plant lists specific native plant lists specific to different situations. Uh, another great plant one is the California Native Plant Society CalScape tool. Um, if you don't know what that is, um, if you go to CalScape, www.calscape.org um, and put in your zip code, it will give you a list of plants specific to the to your zip code 
uh, that's important because that's a great way to get native plants that will be somewhat more successful than just running out and buying whatever you can find at the local nursery. Um, so, uh, and, and then uh, uh, there are uh, uh, other um, uh, UC uh, in, um, websites from other areas um, in Contra Costa County and uh, Sonoma County, Nap Napa County, uh, and so on, uh, that have similar plant lists for those areas. And I recommend that you go to those. Um, uh, and, uh, and then there are you know, commercial plant lists at a number of different nurseries uh, that are, I think, really useful for two things. First of all, they show you, uh, gee, you can come here and buy these things, actually. Uh, that's the first interesting piece of information. Not always e easy to find them. Um, and then the second thing is they usually have some really good uh, information on how to plant and how to take care of these native plants in uh, uh, different situations. Fantastic. Well, I think that's about it for today. Uh, we thank everyone for tuning in. We thank Bob especially for the presentation and for all of the hard work he has done building the garden, building the house, taking all the photographs and organizing the presentation. It's, it's quite a body of work. I'm impressed. Uh, so thank you, Bob. And everybody, we we'll hope to see you next week, same time, same station. Uh, and uh, 10 o'clock uh, for Suzanne and uh, some more water-wise gardening tips. So we'll say sayonara and uh, see you next time. <laughs>